Welcome to the Sensibly Speaking Podcast. This is Chris Shelton, the critical thinker at large, coming to you for another podcasting episode of Great Awesomeness, uh, brought to you here on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and with video on YouTube. You can also find us on iHeartRadio and perhaps a few other places out and about on the interwebs. This week, we are going to be talking about some one of my favorite topics, actually, uh, and something that is very... Um, well, of course, near and dear to the, my heart and to the purpose and, and uh, I guess, the purpose of my channel. Uh, and that is getting, talking to people, dealing with people, especially people you know, people you love even, who are somehow wrapped up in or entangled in high control groups, authoritarian groups, so the, the subject of coercive persuasion. Uh, joined a cult. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of ways to put this. There's a lot of ways to frame what is going on with somebody who gets involved in a group that maybe has aspects to it or parts of it that might be a little more controlling or dominating or, you know, than, than maybe we would be comfortable with. And, and when you get concerned about people who are in these groups, whether they're a friend or a family member, a coworker even, associate of some kind, there's a lot of questions. What do you do? What do you say? How do you talk to them? What Should you say anything? If you do, what should you say? Uh, because I think most people find in trying to open conversation on this topic with people that it can be difficult. They can be sensitive. They can be, they can be snarky. They can be surprisingly angry very quickly. Uh, or they can turn around and try to start selling you on it. And you're like, uh, this isn't really what I had in mind, so what do I do with this, right? And, and then there are people who think, well, I should go study up on it and become an expert in it and then debate it with them or show them how they're wrong or convince them. And, you know, maybe that's an approach, and it, it is, and maybe it's not a very good one. So what what is the right thing to do? Well... This week, I am bringing on board, finally, somebody I've actually had my eye on wanting to get on my show for quite some time and just had this, that, and the other thing get in the way. And this is a man named Christian Shorko. Okay, now I'm getting the last name wrong, I am sure, because I love to butcher names. But Christian, welcome to my show. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm glad to be here. I, I, I follow your channel. Uh, I've enjoyed a lot of your broadcasts, so I'm glad to be here. Thank well, you thank for inviting you. me. That you are very welcome. Thank you for coming on. You have been highly recommended, uh, John Atak, uh, who is a frequent guest on the show here and a wonderful man, has, has said, has made bold claims in your name that you are perhaps one of the, if not the best person he's ever run across who has had the, the, the most success with getting people out of or talking to and having success with people who are in high control groups or abusive religions or abusive sex or these groups that we talk about. And I understand that you like to not use the word cult because it's a bit of a loaded word and I get totally understand that. So why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Okay. Uh, by the way, you've reminded me, I've got to send john another publicity check for my PR. <laughs> um, no no other reason he'd say that um right a little bit about myself i've been doing this work now off and on initially uh since about 1973 but then i just became immersed in it um essentially when i came to this country and i mean i'm in the uk for those who don't know uh, when i came to this country in 1976 i found myself gravitated over into it and it became a full-time thing um the dialogue center is the organization that i started here in 1984 we became a charity in the year 2000 uh, so that's kind of the overview of the structure of it all and it started quite simply when i found that i could talk to people and listen to people and they were happy to talk to me about what they'd gotten involved in and uh somehow it seemed that it, i was able to help in many cases and uh 
it just seemed like a natural fit. And the more I did it, the more I realized that I feel more comfortable doing this than any of the alternatives I could think of. Um, originally, I had been training to be a Christian pastor. And then I realized that my fit is with people who are out and about looking for answers in extreme forms of, of belief. Um, and that very rapidly grew into a, a kind of a, a view of what the essence is of the abuses and the harm that's being done. So I classify them as extremism, authoritarianism, and separatism, or what I call sectarianism. Um, using a functional definition like that meant I could avoid the, as you say, highly emotive word like cults, and the, or the highly useless term new religious movements, which is, I mean, it's so useless, it doesn't even deserve to be described any further than just the word useless. And, you know, all these, these terms, and all I wanted to do was get to a functional description rather than a label. And for me, those three things are the essence of that functional description. And so that, that became my concern. And over time, that grew into the realization that it's not just religions. Uh, very often, one of the problems is that people think that this is all about religions and the abuse in religions, uh, or even about religion itself. And what I found is you can have a management training course. Uh, I once experienced personally a sales course. Uh, it was a, a summertime sales course for students. And it was so authoritarian and so extreme and so utterly weird that I realized this has, you know, there, there's no religion involved in, in this. There is, there is nothing you can put your finger on. This is just pure manipulation and control of a group of people to get them to go out and manipulate and control other people to spend large sums of money. And uh, so, I, you know, I began to see that this went right across the board that way. And along the way, I met people who had experienced abuse in individual relationships. And again, it's that common thread of extremism, authoritarianism, and separating people, um, isolating people, if you will. So that, that's really how I got started. And uh, that's how I've continued. I think Excellent. that's Excellent. No, that's Did great... I actually answer the question? Or no, did you I just did. go off on my week? My we no, hate Nathan. No, well, no, I obviously have questions from there, but thank you for that overview. That that gives a, that gives an idea of what you're involved in in the world that you're that you're in. And I'm curious how you you mentioned you were training as a Christian pastor, and then you saw you know that this is applicable across these different fields, and that's very true. I've certainly harped on that more than a couple times. How did that transition happen? What what changed from Christian pastor to okay, now I got to get people. Well, I'd come, in, I'd come into, in, into Christianity from outside, from way outside. Um, I had begun in, I'd begun quite young in Hinduism, in fact, a form of Hinduism, gravitated into Buddhism. That quickly morphed and became this kind of, um, this kind of new age all inclusiveness wrapped around meditation, and. Um, the common thread there was that you could control people's consciousness. You could guide people's consciousness in such a way that they changed as people, even though they didn't intend that or realize that. Uh, and even though they weren't thinking in terms of, of any kind of religious faith necessarily, they were just being what we now, you know, we now talk about people being spiritual, but not religious. Well, that started all the way back in the sixties and seventies. And, um, and I, I was an early part of that. I suppose under the right circumstances, I would have ended up being swallowed up by something else. But in this case, I came to my own conclusions that I was missing a big part of the picture, which was mainly people. Um, that intense kind of meditating and intense kind of, of personal change also included the loss of personal relationships and the the inability to connect to people properly on a deep level as people they became kind of like ghosts you know as if my world were populated by by puppets or ghosts or whatever you want to call it 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 all became very 
now I realize I, it had become very dissociated. And yet there was this pull to see things like justice. I was involved in the civil rights movement and in the uh, peace movement. And like, there, there was no marrying those two things up because on the one hand I was saying, this shouldn't be happening in the world. And on the other hand, I was saying, fundamentally, the world is not of any ultimate significance. And marrying those two things together didn't fit. And that eventually um, led me to what I would call a conversion experience. And the trouble is that I saw the Christian pastorate as a way of reconnecting with people and doing something for people. Martin Luther King is, is a hero of mine since I was a little boy. And, and I saw that as a, a way forward for me, but that wasn't going to take place in the church because I knew something about that other world that most people in the church, A, didn't know about and B, didn't really relate to in any meaningful way. And I realized that the only way that I could be the person that I feel that I'm supposed to be is to relate outside to people who are looking in all the wrong places and getting hurt by looking in all the wrong places. And uh, yeah, I, I guess I, I guess it was it was that realization that I would be wasting a part of myself just being in a church, being churchy. There are people who need to do that and who are good at it. I'm not good at it. There are people who need that done. But I, I, it, I'm not that person, if you see what I mean. I totally see uh, what you mean. Yeah. So in a way, I, I, I see that I can do the most good by going out to the people who are in the same kind of predicament that I was in where they're being exploited, where they're being disconnected from the world, disconnected from their own lives, disconnected from their own best selves, and help them to ask themselves the basic questions like, what do I really want to do with my life? Why am I doing this? And is it doing for me what I need it to do? Is this, am I really happy with myself? And if I'm not, what am I supposed to do about that? Yeah, those are good questions. Tough questions, too. You know, a lot of people struggle yeah, with that. Yeah. For I'm, I'm not sure I've finished answering them for myself, but I'm working on it. Yeah, exactly. Well, cool. So then you mentioned here these three qualities of extremism, authoritarianism, and separatism. And these seem to be identifying characteristics for you of what yeah. these kind of groups that you're concerned about or troubled about or helping people with. Uh, interesting. I, um, I certainly true. I, I certainly see all of those in, in every one of these groups we've ever talked about on my channel. I'm curious about what you think. Just, I, I'm just curious. Uh, I've sort of brought it down my, for myself, for my own way of thinking. I have <laughs> described these, these troublesome groups or cults or authoritarian groups or whatever as, um, in essence, an abusive relationship between Absolutely. a leader, leadership, and, and followers. And, and it is a codependent relationship in, in a literal sense of that, not, not necessarily with all the baggage that codependency brings but as a term, but just the idea that, that the leaders need mm -hmm. the followers and the followers need the leader. It goes both ways in order for it to work, even if it's only a two-person narcissistic relationship. Do exactly. you do you think that's do you think I'm on the right track with that? I think I think that is absolutely it because I think and I think this is something that came home to me very early on in my own life which is how I got where I am now is the realization that relationship is at the core of everything. You know, our humanity could be described as the outworking of our relationships and how we form them, how we misform them, how we heal them if necessary, and if we're capable of it. Uh, so I think relationships are absolutely at the core of everything. An, an individual human being, as opposed to a single human being, an individual isolated human being with no relationships at all is not going to be a healthy, wholesome person. Um, 
you know, there, there are these, there are the studies that people have talked about where uh, newborn infants who aren't given physical contact and relationship from the parent, usually from the mother, uh, they don't thrive the way a child does who is cuddled and fed and nursed and, and, and is given that personal attention. We are made for relationship. I think, I, you know, I think that's how we have developed as, 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 as a species. We are relational. We're not solitary. And the, the whole reason that I break that down, I suppose you could say that what I have done is to break down the concept of relationship into these three areas. Extremism, this idea that you are taught to believe something so fiercely and so absolutely that you're not allowed to question anything. You're not allowed to bring in any other sort of information or ideas. You're not allowed to have other thoughts that aren't part of that body of teaching. And authoritarianism, which tells you where that body of teaching comes from, and which is not to be questioned under any circumstances. And isolation, sectarianism, separatism, whichever word you choose. This idea that we are the people who have adhered to this authority and his extremist or her extremist teaching. And we aren't like anybody else. Uh, we are homo novus. We are, you know, <laughs> right. we, are, we are separate from everybody else and nobody else even measures up. Um, like, like the person that once told me because I was discussing something that they did in one of their meditative practices with them. And I said something that I wasn't supposed to know because I'm not initiated into their group. And their reaction, instead of being curious like a normal person, you know, how did you know about that? Did, you know, I, I thought that wasn't public knowledge. How did you hear about that? What I got back was a very vituperative attack along the lines of, who do you think you are? How dare you talk, even talk about that? You're not even human. You're not initiated. Um, you know, that, that kind of isolation where we are the soul people and everybody is lesser mortals. Um, those are really three different ways that relationship is broken in this kind of of group. So I would say you're you're absolutely on it there. When I I remember hearing you say that in one of your podcasts and saying, "Yes, somebody's got it." You know, because um it's so easy to get caught up in other things that we see and that are right there on the surface and not penetrate down to that that underlayer that says, "Here's here's the core, here's the root of the thing." And so I, when I heard you say that, I was really quite chuffed. I was pleased. Excellent. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I wanted to bring that up because I wanted to focus right from the get-go on the essence or core of what it is that you are dealing with when you're talking to somebody or interacting with somebody who's in one of these groups. You know, regardless of, of your relationship with the person, you, you know, understanding that they have established this relationship and it is a strong one. It's one that even if it's new, it can still be very, you know, like, oh, this is it. This is the thing, right? And that, and that extremist mindset sets in. And, and then all of the person's priority and importance, you know, to a, to a degree that I think would be, uh, we could call, uh, well, I think you could say their priorities are a little out of whack. <laughs> it might be one way of putting it. Um, and this is due to, you know, the, the, all these factors we talk about with the brainwashing, propaganda, mar you know, all the other things. So, but in, the, in essence, it's a relationship. It's this, it's this thing that you are going to be talking to them about. And I wanted to be clear about that because it's not, well, would you agree with me if I said, you know, it's not the beliefs themselves that are the most important part of what you're trying to address with the person the beliefs are obviously key to the whole thing, but it's what the, the, the beliefs are built on this other thing first, which is this trust factor that somehow gets established between the person and the leadership or the dogma or whatever they, they think represents this group to them. That's the thing you're trying to get to the heart of. Is that, would that be right? Um, I think, I think that's, I think that's most of what I would say. Okay. Um, the way, the way I, I picture it in my mind. Do you know how a laser works? This idea that you have these two highly mirrored surfaces mm -hmm. and you introduce the energy into the crystal and the energy bounces back and forth between the two mirrors until it reaches a certain point at which it is able to burst through. And I see it like that where 
you you are you are feeding back and forth between the individual authority and the charisma of the leader um the the image he projects of being a hero of being um p powerful and wise and knowing and having some kind of special something whether it's insight or power or you know whatever he's selling himself as whatever his theater is as a friend of mine would put it um and there's that and then there is what he's telling you to believe because he can only maintain his relationship with you as your authority if he presents you with a worldview that over overrides uh, your own and and takes over how you see the world it becomes a new lens if you like to see the world but that only lasts as long as his authority lasts and so the energy goes back and forth between those two mirrors and the way I picture it in my head, because it, the picture helps me, is to see that that's what creates the urge to separate, the belief that, yes, this group is, we are the people, and wisdom will die with us. Um, you know, that, that, that elitism that is so important to maintaining a, a cohesive group. Um, and as, as I just said briefly before, there's this friend of mine who... Um, has referred to this as the theater of the guru, where he presents he presents a picture, projects a picture of himself while hiding. He's invisible. The real leader is invisible, but he's projected this vision of himself. And then that is his means of creating the theater, creating the whole play that you're watching, which we can say is the belief system. And the, the interplay of those two things that then make you want to sit in the theater and stay there and be part of it. And you only break out when he ceases to be invisible, when you, when you begin to grasp what he's doing and you start, if you like, catching up to him. And you see him for more of for what he really is. And then the shine is off. The charisma isn't so strong because you realize how flawed he is. And on the other hand, once you realize how flawed he is, the the system starts to break down because if he's flawed then maybe this stuff he's taught you includes error includes nonsense and you start thinking about it and reevaluating re it and then you start asking questions and in the extremist worldview questions are the same thing as doubt doubt is the same thing as sin or whatever word the group uses instead of the word sin and it's not forgivable it makes you a bad person you're not a curious person or an inquiring person. You're a bad person. So questions are themselves uh, rejected. But now the shine is off the leader. And now the questions you're going to dare to ask. You're going to dare to look and say, you know, did is, is this preacher really living a life of poverty? Or is he really living a life of faithfulness to his wife? Is he really being a good upright pastor or is he in fact taking teenage boys to a motel or is he in fact pocketing large sums of money or is he in fact sleeping with the choir master's wife or whatever's going on in there instead you start asking those questions because now you realize well if he's not who he says he is or she's not who she says she is then the questions aren't wrong the questions are quite sensible to ask and that can then enable the person to begin saying hmm but yes I, I do think the relationship is key there not only because it bolsters everything else up but also because the person will be very protective until they see for themselves something that makes them wonder and doubt well exactly that make, uh, that makes complete sense and listening carefully to what you were just talking about there i'm wondering is the takeaway there that the first order of business is somehow taking the shine off the leader? Or is that just one of multiple approaches you can take in terms of like, okay, actually, maybe I should back up a second, too, because we might be getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. Because I, I want to ask you about process here. I really I'm very, very curious about it. And I and I and I think my audience is, too. So here you've identified a group as problematic for whatever reason. And let's just say that, it, that those are valid reasons. And you've got somebody, a friend, family member, loved one involved in this group. So what is step one? Like after you've decided 
okay, we got a problem. Like, let's say that's been figured out. Now what? What, what is your process? It all depends on who comes to me and why they come to me. Yep. I mean, there, there, and there's a whole range over the last 40 odd years. Gosh, I've been doing this so long. I, I can't even keep <laughs> back of it anymore. You know, I'm, I'm coming up to 50 years, Chris. Um, Damn, man. It's scary. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, know, I just turned 50. So literally almost my whole life, you've been doing this. That is, that is, a, I'll say that's yeah. a long time as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a long time as far as I'm concerned, too. Yeah. And, but over that period of time, I've seen people come a lot of different ways. I, you know, I, I, there was a when I first got started, in fact, I was working at a job and somebody came up to me at the lunch counter. I was I was having my lunch break and somebody came up to the lunch counter and sat next to me, even though the diner was mostly empty at the time. And uh, turned out to be one of my workmates and said, uh, at, just out of the blue, said, um, there's something I, I've never really talked about to anybody, but, and then he started telling me the story of his involvement in his group, which turned out to be an offshoot of Scientology, actually, but that's another story. Uh, um, a squirrel group, you might say. And, uh, that, you know, so that's one way people just want to, they want somebody to talk to about something and they, for whatever reason, decide that they can talk to me. Uh, I've had phone calls from somebody um, saying, I've got a friend who's in such and such or who's in this group, but I don't know if it's dangerous or not. And I just wanted to talk to you about, about it. And it was just a concerned friend. Or it was the person themselves who didn't want to admit that they were ha having doubts in case word got back that they were asking questions. Or it can be a parent or a spouse or a brother or a sister. So people come for a, a lot of different reasons and in a lot of different ways. Now, I don't know, let's let's take the example of the person themselves coming to me. It's not as as common as all that because members usually are afraid to talk to outsiders and admit that they have a problem. And that tends to be then the person who's calling on behalf of a friend who isn't really a friend, it's themselves. Uh, all I can do is answer their questions. That's all I can do. And usually the first question is, do you think this is a cult? And I'll explain to them that I, you know, I, I'd be interested in knowing, first of all, what they mean by a cult, which usually gets us straight into deep waters because they're not sure themselves. All they know is that they have been told that if somebody thinks you're a cult, that person's a bad person. So, you know, it's easy for me because I don't use the word. I don't think the word is useful anymore. I think the word means so many things to so many people that it means nothing of any use in my particular little bubble here. So I'll say to them, you know, I'd much rather talk about whether the group is helping you to be the, per the best person you can be and what it costs you to do it their way personally. And usually from there, we can talk about things like, well, you know, maybe they started because they were looking for peace. Well, is it giving you peace? What does it cost you in the rest of your life? And we can talk from there and then just, you know, they'll, they'll go away and think about that. And maybe I'll get another call in three months time or something and we'll go a bit further and a bit further until eventually they'll say to me, well, I'm not actually calling for my friend, it's me. And they'll tell me what their real name is sometimes. Sometimes not. It doesn't matter. I don't, I don't worry about that. And then we can talk about, well, let's look at some of the things that might be costing you that you wouldn't want it to cost you. And so then we talk about things like ex you know, extremism, authoritarianism, and separatism. What is your relationship? I like to start with isolation or, or separatism because that's what people feel, mm. you know. What is your relationship with your husband or wife? What is your relationship with your family? What is your relationship with your friends? How is your career? How has this affected your studies? Things like that. What is it doing to you besides making you feel peaceful or besides making you feel like you're going to save the world or besides making you feel like a chosen one or whatever the, the jargon is in the group. By that time, I'll have learned their jargon from the person. Uh, and I should add at this point, I'm not really interested initially in talking about the group. Because as far as I'm concerned, the only 
group that is of any relevance in that conversation with an individual person is the group in their head. So for me, if group A has 10,000 people in it, there's at least 10,000 versions of that group. And that's the, that's the group that I want to talk about. I want to talk about what the group means to that person, how he understands it. And I think this is one of the errors, by the way, the errors that, you know, you, you talked about people saying I should study the group and debate them. I think that's one of the real mistakes we make. And we've all made it. I certainly made it in the beginning. I thought to myself, I got to hurry up and understand this group so I can talk about it with this person. And I realized that wasn't helping him. And then I had to backtrack and say, well, what, what does he need? Well, what helped me? What got me out of that mess that I was in? And how did p other people interact with me that was useful to me? And I had to put it all together from that. And the thing that I concluded and still believe is true is that, you know, somebody calls me, let's say from Scientology, because you're an ex-Scientologist and we can talk that way. Somebody wants to talk to me about that. The only Scientology I'm interested in is what he knows Scientology to be in his personal experience. If he doesn't know what OT3 is, why would I want to talk to him about that? If he's never seen these other things, why would I want to start there? The time may come further down the road when that's a valid topic of our conversation, but that's no place to start. That, that's the first rule that I have for myself is to start where that person is. Go find him or go find her. Well, these are, so, there are a lot, sense. there's a lot of stuff you've already said that I want to, I want to stop for a second and highlight some points because, okay. um, because it's such, this is such good stuff, and you are making some incredibly important points right now. And I want to point out to people that there's some counterintuitive stuff in what you're saying, too. Because what we see, I'm sure you've seen this, I certainly have over just the last couple, just the couple years I've been doing this, is, you know, the, uh, family and friends get so eager beaver about how they want to explain why this is so wrong to the person. Yeah. They want to tell them and lecture them about why what they don't get or what they don't understand or what they haven't seen yet that they, that they saw in South Park or they saw on the Internet or they saw in some book or something somewhere. And and your approach as completely predictable, of course, is no. Whoa, 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 whoa. Air brakes. Hold it. Stop. No, 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 slow down there, there, cowboy. You, you don't need to overload them with information. You need to be listening more than talking. Yeah. yeah. The other thing you said that is, uh, or, or put in there that is very, very crucial is non-judgmental. Mm -hmm. Is you're not coming at this from the viewpoint of telling them, you know, you, your first response is, you know, to the question, am I in a cult? Is not, hell yeah, you are. <laughs> Right? It's, well, wait a minute, what do you mean by cult? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's an important question. Yeah. And then, and I thought this was something that I, that I didn't see coming that I thought was quite brilliant, is consulting, is asking them, what's it doing for you? Yeah. But when you really ask that question and you demand a well-rounded answer and you get past the, it saved my life. My whole life is better because of like the automatic, you know, immediate, yeah. you know, cult member answer of, you know, there's nothing better. It's the most wonderful thing ever. You do after, if you can keep going past the euphoric answer and then go, what you have well, to do it exactly. How's it helping you with your family? Mm -hmm. Now, there's a good question, because yeah. odds are you're talking to this person because there has been conflict with family or with friends or with this person's troubled or the family members are troubled. Somebody's problem. Somebody's got a problem here. Yeah. And this is a way of, sh of through questioning, showing the person or getting the person to talk and see, oh, actually, that euphoria is only centered around me and my own experience, but everybody else around me, I'm not getting along with them so well anymore, <laughs> you know? Anyway, I just wanted to point those out because they, they are, and I say counterintuitive because people don't seem to realize this is how they should approach people with compassion, tolerance, and understanding. They want to convince them. They want to debate them. They want to argue with them or something. And I wanted to set, I wanted to point, highlight that right away sure. in, in all the things you were saying there, because I think those were important points. 
Well, thank you. Uh, you summed it up so much better than I did. <laughs> <laughs> I... <clears throat> You're doing fine. You're doing totally fine. Um, You're the expert here. I'm just trying to make sure I understand what you're saying and that the audience gets the... You you bring an important other point there um, that I, it would be easy to, to miss. And that is that, you know, this grew out of a historical situation. I, I stumbled on this way of doing things um, in the context of the 1970s when the prevailing approach was deprogramming. And by deprogramming, we don't mean any of the euphemisms um, we mean the hardcore Ted Patrick style, come in, snatch them off the street and kidnap them. Let's put, let's use the right words for this, kidnap them and detain them until we can force them to do what we want them to do. And once I, once I came out of my own weird space, I realized that I was so glad that my family never tried to do that to me. Uh, I met somebody who'd who'd had that done, done and okay, so they were out of their group, but they, they had no answers to questions. They weren't even sure what their questions were and they still weren't at, at a good place in their own lives. And I thought, let's start at first principles here. Number one, it's illegal. Number two, it's immoral. Number three, the results, if you wanna be purely pragmatic about it, the results are very iffy and you know, so, even forgetting the pragmatic thing, just on the first two, why would you do that? And that, that was important to me, this idea that it was, that you don't help a person to become a person by treating them as if they're not a person. You don't counteract authoritarianism by establishing a new form of authoritarianism. Exactly. You don't, you don't, exactly save a person out of br being brutalized emotionally and spiritually and mentally by doing that to them all over again. You know, and, and I had all these sort of pictures in my head of, you know, I, 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 yeah, I won't even burden your audience with some of the, some of the horror that I had when I realized that people were doing this, but I was determined to find a different way to go about this because it seems to me that the best way to teach a person to enjoy their independence is to treat them as independent people, not to in incarcerate them, to try and bludgeon their ideas into whatever you think they should be. And you know, this, this is a hot button for me, I admit it, because it's still going on in other guises. You know, now we have boot camps and we have de-radicalization. Sometimes it's done properly, or at least it's it's attempted to be done properly. I can't speak for the results because I'm not involved in it. But sometimes it is little better than incarceration and bludgeoning. Now, how, shouldn't we have learned from the 1970s that deprogramming, whatever name you give it, is a bad idea and people should be saying, no, we, we will not have anything to do with that. But I watched it happen. I saw people make excuses for it. I saw people come up with nice terms for it. And I just had to say, wait a minute, what, what really should happen here? And what really should happen here to my mind is start with that person. That person is the only person who knows a, what he needs and b how to find it. Exactly. So exactly. I, I felt that anything, I, if I was going to do this as a serious part of my life, I had to find ways of accommodating myself to the other person rather than making them accommodate to some predetermined picture I have of the group or of them or of what they need or any of the rest of it. And so that was how I shaped what I did. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I actually intended to ask you about the, what I was going to call the deprogramming craze of the seventies and eighties, because it was a craze and it was crazy. Huh. And it was going on way, I mean, I, I don't even want to say way too often. A any of those things are too often. I mean, it was right. really, and it was illegal. It was criminal activity. So I'm glad. And that it was you, immoral. You, you just don't yeah. treat people like that. You exactly. don't. We're on the same page. And, I, <laughs> and I'm glad because I came in after all, I came into this world after all of that. And, and after everybody kind of came to their senses and realized, <laughs> whoa, that was... That was not a good idea. 
Um, but I'm glad you never got involved in that in the first place. I'm I'm wondering. I mean, there must have been. Were you? Did you experience peer pressure or, or? Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah yeah. Um, not so much in the '70s, but in the very early '80s when I was already here, um, there was this this alternative way of doing it. This was what you could call maybe softy programming, which took the line, um, well. And this is this is the the so-called exit counselor now speaking along the lines of well just invite me over to your house for dinner and then invite your loved one to dinner and you can introduce me as an old friend of the family and we'll get to talking and we'll talk about their group and it'll all kind of naturally develop so what you're doing now is instead of kidnapping the person you're lying to them you're encouraging the family to lie to them and you're trying to build some perspective on the group's use of lying and deception based on your own lying and deception now there um, is a there is a i'll push back a little bit here just okay. to play devil's advocate for just a moment Please. because i'm i i'm i'm not you know in wild disagreement with anything that you're saying here and i definitely agree that honesty is the best policy especially when dealing with somebody who is part of a group hmm. that got them and and recruited them through deceptive means and is actively keeping them by lying to them. It, it's certainly true that uh, you don't win by taking on the enemy's, uh, you know, cult especially or or high control groups methods. Mm -hmm. What would you say though to us to <clears throat> like? Well, how do you then get them in a situation where they're willing to talk to you because? You know, sometimes it's pretty clear that some of these group members, not all of them by any stretch, but certainly some of them have no interest in being talked to by anybody who's oh, going to have anything negative to say about their group. So how, so right. it sounds great. It sounds very principled, right? In principle. But then how do you make that connection happen? Okay. Now that you've actually touched on something that I had to solve. Mm -hmm. um, because it was a problem. It meant that I was eliminating that that natural channel that some people thought they had created, which I didn't consider natural. I just I just don't see how you can. First of all, I don't see how parents or family or whoever it is that's trying to get me involved to talk to their loved one. I don't see how they are making their relationship, which is already being alienated by the group's story about family and about the past, because they all do it. I don't see how the parents are healing that relationship by adding lies because they've already been told, as likely as not, the person in the group has already been told, well, your parents can't be trusted. They do lie to you or they manipulate you or they want to use you or they expect you to be, you know, you know what I mean. Oh, yes. a, a different, different varieties and different groups, but there's always this bottom line that your family and your friends are not good for you. You need to replace them with us. Now, if that's the leader's story, and the leader is being being very duplicit about duplicitous about this, and is telling the members, well, you know, they will lie to you to try and trick you into leaving us, and they will manipulate you. Now, the parents come along and get caught in a lie in order, let's say, to establish a relationship with someone like me. How does that affect the members' perception of outsiders? Does it confirm the leader's story or does it undermine the leader's story? So that's my first problem. My second problem is if I come in as a stranger based on a lie, how do we build a healthy relationship? How do I build a relationship in which I can help that person built on a lie when I have to... I, I have to just happen to be a family friend that this person has never heard of in the last 20 years of living with his parents or however long of knowing his parents from the inside. But here I am, a family friend he's never even heard a whisper of. Um, he may have heard of me, if, I, if we're really unlucky, he may have heard of me through the cult leader, the group leader, that, you know, I'm a deadly demon or whatever I am. So, you know, but even if that hasn't happened, I just happen to be a family friend who appears out of nowhere and knows about his group and knows about 
manipulation in, in an abusive situation and is offering to help him. How believable is that? And how do we build a trusting relationship? Because all of counseling is based on the ability to establish rapport and trust. All of it. Right. So how, you undermine so, that it doesn't matter how good I am. So how do you do it then? Because you've outlined the problem explicitly. Yeah. But now, now what? <laughs> well, the problem is the problem is so to, to my mind, and yeah. I know people will disagree with me, and they're entitled to disagree with me. Um, but in my experience, the problem is so absolute, or nearly absolute, that I feel it necessary, or felt it necessary, to come up with an alternative. And for me, it goes back to that word you used before, relationship. It's all about the relationship. At some point, because I come at this not with the desire, with the set agenda of getting the person out of their group, I come at it from the standpoint of what can I do to help this person? What can I help to do to help this family unit or these, this unit of friends? That's my purpose. Um, anything else is, is a bonus if it helps. Um, so I encourage these people who have asked me to get involved in this, I encourage them to re-examine what they're really trying to do first and to reconsider that the most important thing in their whole thing isn't whether they drag the person out of their group or not, willingly or, or unwillingly, but whether they can reestablish a wholesome relationship and to work from that standpoint, which means that I'm not there to get Joey or or Linda to leave whatever group it is. I'm there to get all of them talking to each other and especially listening to each other. That's my purpose. Once they do that, and I will I will spend a lot of time with the family or whoever called me in, teaching them techniques for listening so that they actually hear what the other person's saying. And I encourage them to then sit down and talk together without me there, talk together about what's wrong with their relationship. How, how has the relationship gone wrong? With special attention to letting the member explain how he or she feels about their reaction to the group and to their membership in the group. And, and how, would you, how would you approach a family or friend situation where somebody contacts you and, okay, let's say the son, let's say, let's okay. say, you know, parents contact you and the son's gotten off in some group. But let's say that the relationship is fine. I mean, it's not a case of they're, they have a bad relationship necessarily, but it's, but the, but the cult has created a, 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 a schism, right? Or a schism, or how do you say that? But, you know, they, they, they've created that rift. And yes. now there's, you, you, you know how you, you know how you read a word and you, and then you try to say it out loud and it's like you know yes. you know I, yes, the, I first, do. The, the first time I ever said Yosemite I pronounced it Yosmite right <laughs> like you, you're just like what we've all been there Chris. yeah exactly we've exactly so um but here you have a situation where the family's like look it's not that ain't it it's 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 that this group has created this rift between us and now he won't talk to us now he you know and and all we said was. Hey, that sounds that doesn't sound so great, you know, or what so you're already describing you're already describing a situation where the relationship isn't great. Well, exactly, so, but not so necessarily that. because of what the family has done. Is I I'm oh. I'm only I'm only asking because I think family yeah. might be listening to this and thinking to themselves, well, yeah, but we didn't do anything wrong. You and see, they, you this, know what this, I mean? This whole oh absolutely. This whole process yeah. isn't about who's to blame. The whole process is how can we all pull together to fix whatever happened? I don't, I'm not interested in blame. I, I, the older I get, the more I realize how counterproductive it is to figure out who to point the finger at. There are times right? when you do need to do it. <laughs> right? admit it. I admit. I know. Yeah, I admit it. There are times when you do need to point the finger. But for the most part, in a situation like that especially, pointing the finger does nothing except mean that one of your fingers gets colder than the other ones because it's sticking out pointing. Um, and I would the much other rather... three are pointing back at you. <laughs> well, yeah, there is that as well, isn't there? Um, but far more useful to, to my mind is to say, right, what, what is the point of friction? What is the point of alienation? 
how can you fix it? Why don't you start, for example, getting, let's, let's use your example because it's easier than saying this or that or this or that, um, getting the family to learn to listen by practicing listening, by practicing an active listening technique that I will teach them and getting them to ask their son in this case, what has gone wrong between us? What, what do you see as being wrong with this? And how, you know, how did, how did we get where we are to the point where you don't like us to write you letters, you don't want us to call you, you, you don't answer when we call, whatever's going on with them. And just listen. Don't respond, don't defend, don't counterattack, just listen. And at the end of that, having made very careful attention to the details of that and knowing now, oh, so my son feels that we've done this or that and this, I, we now know, we now have a catalog. Now, go away and think about that and establish as part of this process, we'd like to come, we'd like to go away and think about that and not try and understand that. And then we'd like to come back and talk to you about it further. And we'd like to be able to, to talk with you about it rather than just answering off the top of our heads right now. Is that okay? And establishing a second meeting. Interesting. Now, very often, you'd be surprised, very often, this can be the catalyst for a real understanding and a real healing of the rift if the rift wasn't too bad. If it is too bad, I go in, I offer to go in as a mediator of sorts, not in the normal sense of a negotiator mediator, but rather as somebody who simply acts as neutral ground where both people can talk and can listen and can be heard and can be interpreted. So I will say to people, you know, I, I would say to the parents in that instance, suggest that I come in and act as a go-between between the two of you and give him my number and have him call me and decide if he is willing to talk to me and if he's willing to trust me with the process now here comes the okay. first wrinkle yeah what if he is a staff sea org something like that where there's no possibility that he's going to call you or you're going to call him. I would never call him because it's not my place. He has to decide to call me. Fair enough. But because it, I'm, it's, it would be morally wrong in my eyes. It would be ethically wrong for me to pursue him. So the ethics of that are that you know, his parents are saying to him, we just want you to call him and decide if you trust him enough to act as a go-between to help us get past this sticking point. Right. And if that call never comes then you just work with the family from that point I would forward. just work with the family towards that point where they have refined how they talk and listen. Because, see, I'm not interested in, in these do-or-die conversations where we've got to make it all work now or else we're lost forever. I'm not interested in them, not because they never happen, but because they don't have to happen as often as most people think. You know, this isn't an episode of 24. Um, yep. And to me, every conversation, the goal of every conversation is for it to be an open conversation where we can follow this up the next time. So I encourage families to get to the point where they are comfortable listening and hearing, and if necessary, accepting that some of the criticisms or some of the um, problems that their loved one has, that their son has, might be partly accurate. They might need to say, you know, we never thought of what we did as being like that or that it might affect you that way. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I said that to you or I'm sorry I did this or I'm sorry I acted that way. How have you... You don't lose anything that way. No, totally. And I'm curious now, how have you dealt with um, situations where they, where the, the loved one in this, in, you know, that see, one of the problems with these groups, of course, being destructive cults, as we like mm -hmm. to call it, as I like to call them. I know you wish you that word, and I totally get it. But they are destructive. We do agree they on are. that. They are I do certainly agree that they can be destructive. Absolutely. So we have, 
I'm curious whether, you know, it sounds as though you're talking about, you know, counseling patience and understanding, which is crucial to the process. I'm curious if that process is ever interrupted or um, expedited because of considerations or concerns about the physical or mental well-being of the person continuing to be part of that group. It Perhaps be, there's yeah. fear that the person's being abused physically or sexually. <laughs> not proof, not evidence, nothing you can go to the police with, but there's concern, concern right? Sure. How do you change your approach in any way because of considerations like that? That is difficult because mm -hmm. the chances are, the more likely it is that they're being exposed to abuse, the more likely it is that they're being isolated, either by being by, by fear induction, phobia induction of outsiders, or by being barred from contact. You know, actual physical, we will not pass the letters on to this person from their family. We will not allow this person to receive phone calls from the family, whatever. So in that case, then yes, it is, it is a real concern. And I'm not saying that this is a perfect approach. And, you know, Obviously, where there, where there is illegality, you have to address it as illegality. Um, let's let's take an extreme example. Let's take an example of someone who is um, in a group where there is a lot of sexual abuse going on. The leaders are sexually abusing the meditators or the members. <sighs> Somebody somewhere has got to be able to go to the police and say, I have a suspicion that there is this going on. Now, if, if we're talking about something that extreme, then it is not, it is no longer, if you like a counseling problem, it is because it just isn't, that's the law. The law is that once it crosses over into illegality, you're not talking about, well, let's kind of work this out together. No, that's, we're past that now. Now it's the law. So that becomes complicated when, for example, you've got a 16 or 17 year old in another country in the sect from the family and there is you know fortunately that's relatively rare but it's it's it is happening often enough that it's a real problem and i don't have an answer for it understood well i wanted to ask about that because i know it's going to be a concern for some people i also want to stress though and i'd like you now that we've kind of gone to this extreme end of of somebody who's like maybe in physical danger or you know or or, or you know something like that okay good so now we acknowledge that that's actually the fear, and that fear is hyped up in a lot of, you know, propaganda or anti-cult literature and stuff. And, mm -hmm. and so now we can kind of actually address the fact that that actually is not the everyday common experience of people in these groups. It is, um, you know, there, there is always that potential for yes. that. Scientology has it. Mormons have it, JWs have it. I mean, there are things that have happened to children. Yeah. There are things that have happened to, to women, it, to men. There's physical yeah. abuse, et cetera. So we do have those circumstances. It's not, oh, yeah. I'm not trying to downplay their, their significance or their importance when they're happening. But I wanted, to, um, I wanted to see where you were at on that because I thought this is also, like everything, it's a little bit of a spectrum maybe of yes. how deep is the person into this and how deep is their experience gone into it. Your run of the mill, for example, public Scientologist, I can tell you without, you know, without question or without fear of contradiction, most of them are only experiencing financial stress. Yeah. And psychological stress through the counseling techniques. There are things sure. being done to them psychologically that are not good for them. Uh, but they're probably not going to be sexually assaulted. They're probably not going to be beaten on. They're not going to be thrown in a hole. They're not going to do the RPF. Public level Scientologists, that's not a problem. That's not a threat for them. That's not going to happen to them. So we don't have to worry about those kind of extremes and a more slow, dedicated approach like your counseling is totally appropriate for any public Scientologist just about, you know. Uh, even many staff, I would say, Sea Org, gonna have a gonna have a tougher time with that. I'm curious, have you have you dealt with either Sea Org or people who are as isolated as people who are in the Sea Org? I've, 
have actually dealt very little with Scientology mm. simply because in the beginning, I didn't deal with Scientology very much because I didn't encounter it very much. In the 70s, hardly ever encountered it. When I came to this country, in fact, I knew... <laughs> the, the, the odd thing was that the only Scientologists I knew were very well-off people. They weren't actual celebrities, but they were very well-off people with very high-paying jobs who, as public Scientologists, with a lot of money to give to Scientology, had no real issues with it. it and, and they, you know, they just got a bit annoying about, you know, you really should read this book, you really should try this course, and, you know. But apart from that, and of course the 70s was still just on the edge of the, the blissful unawareness of everything, you know. We're talking 1974, 75. And uh, before anything really hit the fan for Scientology publicly. And, uh, you know, it was just a case of, I'm not interested. You're sure. Oh, well, you know, and then they let it slide. Um, but that was it. And then in the 80s, I came into contact with it more, but there was always someone else I, that I could refer it to. And I was still, Scientology, I very quickly established that Scientology is its own universe. Other groups tend to form their own galaxy. <laughs> see see what, I'm, yes. what I'm saying? Yes. Other groups form their own galaxy, and that is sufficient to lock a person in. You don't need a whole universe to lock a person in to a delusion. Yep. A galaxy is sufficient, and most groups, they only establish a galaxy. Scientology, it's like the difference between Tolkien's Lord of the Rings and everything else that's pretending to be like the Lord of the Rings, you know, right. after sometime in the eighties, I noticed that all these fantasy writers were having blurbs on the back of their books saying in this, you know, in the great tradition of the Lord of the Rings or Tolkien-esque. And they weren't, you read them and you thought to yourself, man, you haven't got any idea. Tolkien invented four different languages. He invented whole cultures. He invented, you know, you guys aren't even in the same ballpark with him. You're little leaguers. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, and I, I very quickly became aware Scientology is a universe of its own. And I had so much work. It, all these years, it's always been a case of saying, there's so much I want to do. And then there's only so much I can do, given what I must do. And so I've tried to stick to what I absolutely must do and add to it as and when I can. I know a lot more about Scientology now than I did in the 1980s. That does not mean that I consider myself to be on the level of someone like you or Jerry Armstrong or John. But, you know, I mean, that's crazy. Um, you, any one of you have forgotten more about Scientology than I'll probably ever know. Because it is a whole universe of its own. And until you've lived in that universe, you've, you've only... You, you're you only a tourist at best, as far as I'm concerned. You know, I, I see myself as still being very much of a tourist. So I have always looked to other people for the most part. I've had a few encounters with Scientologists, but for the most part, I've always looked to other people to really take that on because they live in the same universe or they have lived and they know the landmarks. They understand. Having said that, I've also seen ex-Scientologists who I think ought to know better doing some of the, some of the exact things that I would say you just shouldn't be doing that. That's just really not a good idea. For sure. Uh, For you sure. know, at least at least don't start there. Right. But well, let me know, well, let me ask you call. this. Let me ask you this then, because um, because I'm I I'm just so curious. What would you say was one of the, if not the most challenging, what would you say was one of the more challenging cases you've had that would demonstrate some of the principles we've been talking about here and how you overcame them? Different instances have, have offered different challenges, different ultimate challenges, if you like. So, I mean, one of the first things that comes to my mind is that with people who, have, who joined their group at a very young age, you know, in the 70s and, and early 80s, it was a thing for a young teenagers still because you, you were getting that transition from, from hippies to spiritual new age seekers. There was that, that kind of transition period in the 70s. So 
when Maharaji came to this country in 71, there were people, there were kids running away from home to join Divine Light Mission, which is a kind of a rerun of what was going on in the States in the 60s, people packing up and going off to follow Shivananda or follow this one or follow that one, you know, and California was full of them. California was full of these kids and still are other places um, that I never got to visit. But that kind of person, they, maybe they were 14 or 15. They got involved very young. They were still maturing themselves. So they matured. It's a bit like, gosh, this is an extreme example. It's a bit like Chinese foot binding. You know, you take a very young child, you smash her feet bind it with silk strip, uh, strips and the foot grows deformed. It's, it keeps growing, but it grows deformed. And in a way, what was happening was that emotionally they were growing stulted and stultified in some way. They were growing in a deformed kind of a way. Their emotions were hampered in some way or, or just didn't develop at all in some way. Uh, they learned to 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 view as wrong things that would be perfectly natural to a youngster so i mean i i had i had a youngster who well youngster by the time they came to me they were in their 20s but when they joined as youngsters they had they had learned not to play and this wow. was quite common and this was quite a common thing they had learned that play or any amusement or any recreation was time wasting was evil because it wasn't giving full time to Jehovah or um, God or Krishna or whatever the, the, the group in question was. And there were a number of occasions, I, I very quickly learned that one of the good things to do with someone was to take them to a park at a time when there weren't a lot of people around, take them to a park and just sit with them on a swing and encourage them to just push and just do that just to learn the feeling of doing this and we would carry on our normal conversation whatever we were talking about but we would carry it on while they were doing this and then i would stop talking and you know get them to just sit and feel the feeling and then after a little while i'd get them to talk what does that feel like to you to to do that and again and again what would come out was well it feels nice but it, it can't be it can't be right. I shouldn't be doing this. It feels nice. It, it just feels too. I, and they would panic. They would actually go in some cases go into panic because there was this residual sense that they were doing something bad and evil. And that and allowed us to talk about new things that were part of the part of the way they carried the group out of the group with them. If you see what I mean. Totally. And yeah. that allowed us then to address these issues like um, <laughs> so often people think, you, you know, you walk out the door, you leave the group behind, and that's it, you're done. <laughs> outsiders, often think this. outsiders often think this. Sometimes even people who are ex-members expect this initially. And what they don't realize is that they have been conditioned by repetition and by indoctrination to go from that thought to that thought with nothing in between. You know, thought stopping techniques like meditation or slogans or speaking in tongues or whatever is used in the group, quotations from L. Ron Hubbard, whatever it might be, you use those things to say, ah, this experience, boom, that's the correct response. You don't stop doing that just because you wake up one morning and say, I'm no longer a, uh, a Southern Baptist or I'm no longer a Hasidim or I'm no longer this or I'm no, you know, I'm no longer Mormon. You don't stop. Those, those reactions have to be addressed directly and you have to ask yourself the question, do I really believe that anymore? Do I really want to keep thinking that? What can I put in there instead? And how can I make that transition so that it's not just a New Year's resolution, I'm going to stop thinking that way, and it becomes, here's my new pattern of thought. And so by bringing those things up so the person experiences, oh yeah, I still have the teachings of this or that teacher in my head. I do need to talk about that. It helps them to decide for themselves that they have a need there to address. Rather than me saying to them, well, here's what's wrong with you. You've got to do this, you've got to do that, you've got to fix this, you've got to do that, you've got to stop doing this, and you've got to quit that. 
that's that again is taking the autonomy away from the person they've already experienced that they don't need that again so the process is designed to say um let's look at some possible areas where you might want to think about what you do next give them some experiences which they can then say yeah i can live with that or no i'm not so sure about that or no that's got to go now i on one occasion when i took somebody on a swing like that they suddenly jumped off the swing and started vomiting because it wasn't from motion sickness it was terror it was terror they they felt that they had done something so evil by having so much pleasure and all they were wow. doing was swinging i think maybe 18 inches of swinging and it terrified them and so we had to take a step back and i apologized of course because i had i had overdone that i had i'd been in my defense if i needed a defense i would say i was still fairly new at establishing what to how to use this but i should have been more sensitive i should have been paying closer attention just because it was new to me to 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 try this and i wasn't paying attention well and at I, the same time i don't know that i'd beat myself up too much about that you were also learning i don't but i learned going, from it you know yeah exactly yeah, I, you learned from I, it. I didn't i didn't beat myself up i just said that <laughs> right, you should never do that to a person you should never a person should never become ill right because you weren't paying attention and so i you know on the other hand maybe them getting ill might have been a little wake-up call to them well, it yeah. was, you know, but, yeah. but the, they, they could have wakened up about maybe a dozen swings back and forth sooner if I would have stopped and said, are you feeling OK? Right. There you go. You know, there you go. That was up to me. That was my job. Right. And, have you, you know, have you run into situations because, you know, I see that this this uh, this process that you're using here is very um like if you were contacted by family and the family would you agree that family tend to be the groups that are most concerned about individuals in these in in high control groups or is it Quite friends often. or business I, associates? I, it, it it tends to be family because they're the people who have the longest running relationship usually yeah uh, and they and the, the closest relationship you know when, when you come right down to it your primary relationship starts about five seconds after you emerge from the womb and it's with your family <laughs> you right. know, one after another of your family so right. that is that is a core that's a core part of our understanding of who we are Big we time. we each you know going back to your your word relationship i don't think it can be emphasized enough we each begin to know who we are through our relationships and the primary relationships are family my family your family that's our first mirror Long before we know what a mirror is or what our face looks like, we know what we get back when we relate to the people around us. You know, that starts straight out of the womb. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and so that, that whole set of primary relationships means that those are the people who are most likely to worry or be anxious unless there's real alienation that went on before the person joined, which sometimes happens. Well, on that note, I'm wondering whether sometimes family might contact you, but then in, in, in speaking with them or assessing the situation out, or maybe even after your first round of talking to the individual involved, you find out, or what would be the decision point for you that maybe the family aren't the right people to be talking to right now with this person? Has that ever come up where... The parents become so toxic or so difficult or so problematic that they kind of need to be out of the picture for a while. Yes. At first, I was going to say no, but I've remembered yes. But the yes comes with certain uh, caveats. Mm -hmm. One occasion I can think of um, the fact that the child had run away from home to join the group they joined. Um, meant that as far as the parents were concerned they no longer had a child they disowned the person entirely and would not discuss the matter so in fact they didn't come to me the person the person came to me from totally other direction um and that that's a whole other story in itself which is too long to tell um another instance though was where the parent the, the father now dead was an alcoholic uh the mother was very seriously mentally ill and very abusive both psychologically and physically um 
I still made the effort to meet with the mother. And when I met the mother, I thought to myself, I am glad this woman has never been involved in this child's life for all these years and is not involved now because this person is genuinely dangerous. Wow. Um, you know, those are, if you, if you want extremes, those are two extremes. Yeah. It's been very rare. It has been very rare. And, and where the next step down from that is, has been where there's been a breakdown in relationship. That's more common where there's mm -hmm. been some kind of a breakdown, you know, whether you call it teenage rebellion or, or you call it uh, over parenting, those kinds of things go on from time to time. They usually, in my experience, which is limited to my own life, um, they usually can be overcome. It's usually possible, and this is why I'm glad to work with the family before we get involved with the member of the group. Because usually, you, through the conversation, you get a feeling for, for this kind of thing. And it, you know, if, if, if necessary, I'll say to, to the parents, um, in your own opinion, do you think that is a suitable way to treat a 17-year-old? I have, I have had to say that to somebody who, um, you know, what, there are, there are things that, there, there are times when parents forget that a 17 year old is not a seven year old. Let me put it that way. And you just have to say, if we're going to go any further, you've got to learn to let go. And that means you've got to learn to respect this person as an adult. This person is becoming an adult and you're treating them like a child. That's not them talking. That's me talking. And you're going to have to learn how to renegotiate your opinion of them and your attitude. You think, think they're making mistakes? That's fine. I think you're making a mistake. You know, um, you know, people are allowed to make mistakes, and it's got to be at the same time. It's got to be as non-judgmental as possible. They're not bad people. Every parent, somewhere, unless they really are mentally ill, and maybe even not then, every parent wants at some level to be enabling their child to grow up at least as well as they grew up, if not better. That, you know, I, I have a great deal of faith in, in the parental instinct in most cases, even though it gets overlaid with cultural BS and um, subcultural BS and, and this pressure to make the child into something or, you know, all that stuff that happens. Yeah. Underneath that, I want to appeal to the parents and say, Let's suppose that you made a mistake. What if we can fix that? What then? I would rather, I'd rather go in that direction and then talk about, well, when your child says to you, I'm in this group because X, Y, Z, what's your normal response? And maybe we'll do a little role play around that and I'll get back from them. How stupid do you have to be to join the, you know, what kind of a jerk is this guy? Or, you know, once I get that back, now I've got something I can work with and I can say to them, well, how would you feel turning that around now? You've done something, you've done what you think is the best you know how, because why would you do any less? Whoever says, I've got a choice. I can do this, which is a good idea. I can do this, which is a bad idea. I think I'll do this. That's a bad idea. It's, that's my choice. People don't do that. And sometimes just by talking parents through the reality of a thing like that, it helps them to say, ah, okay, Maybe I can see that they're making a mistake and they can't see it yet. So instead of getting on their case about it, maybe we just have to remember we're parents and, and we're family and, and work there. You see what I mean? I completely see what you mean. I'm curious whether now switching gears to friends, let's say, let's say the person's family is not in the picture anymore or yep. uh, for whatever reason, just for whatever reason. Yeah. So now you're contacted by like, let's say a spouse or a friend. A uh, slightly different relationship. Yeah. Um, how do those play out? How do those go? How do those? I still go for the relationship. I, you know, I want to say to you, you are writer than you know. Even though writer isn't the word. Um, you know, seriously, it is the relationship. Let's suppose it's a friend. Think about your own friendships. Think of, think of one of your friends. If you saw one of your friends and he announced to you that he was thinking of becoming a heroin addict. What, what happens in here? I might have something to say about that. What happens? Exactly. Exactly. You might not know what to say 
at first, but something in here happens because you care about the person. He's your friend. That's right. And that's where I start. I start with, you know, how can you as a friend say to your, to your friend, because let's face it, the membership in this, in this group probably isn't as cut and dried as heroin addiction, although it might be some, depending on the group. How can you, as a friend, say to your friend, I'm interested to know more about this because I'm concerned about it. I don't know enough to know why I'm concerned or to know that I shouldn't be concerned. So could we talk about this? You know, that's where you start. That's where you start. It's like, you know, any anything else your friend might do that you might be worried about. And start there. Start with just... Always look for the open conversation. You, would you mind if I asked you some questions about this? I don't want to go along to a meeting and be recruited. I don't want to buy a weekend retreat. I just would like to talk to you friend to friend and try to understand what you're doing because, you know, five years down the road, this might be a decision that means we're not able to, to spend time together anymore. And you're my friend. And I don't want to see that happen if, you know, if it's not a good idea. Could we talk? Start there. If that's if that's the level of your friendship, start with the level of your friendship and then get the person talking. And that means learning to listen again. Yeah, exactly. Now, would you say, you know, in talking with you so far about this, you have said that you talk about relationships, you deal with the family, you deal with the individual. Your goal is not necessarily at the outset or at any long at any point along the process to get them out of that cult group or that, that high control group or sect, right? Yeah. Is now, now I want to, I'd like to kind of, I don't want to play around with that. That's, is that a nudge, nudge, wink, wink kind of statement? Or are you really serious no, about that? I'm really serious about that. I have, I have actively left people in their group because they were safer in. See, if you're going to leave your group, you've got to have someplace safe to come out to, and you've got to know in your heart it will be safe to come out to it. Everyone I've talked to who has successfully left a group by themselves, for example, has left with some idea of where they were going to go next. May not have been a clear idea, may not have been a great idea, but it was some idea, usually in the form of someone that they knew who was on the outside but had connections maybe they were uh maybe they were doing some volunteer work recruiting in the in the local library and they'd met this person who got into regular conversations with them but didn't actually join the group you know maybe came along uh to, to a, an evening or something but didn't join the group and they were on the outside and and at some point they just had the sense if I left, this person would help me. They, they, they make sense. They ask questions that make me think. And if I am going to leave, I'll go and talk to that person. Something like that. Or maybe it's a family member. Or maybe it's the family as a whole where they realize uh, a problem that we used to have more back in the 70s and 80s than we do now, I think. Well, let's say it this way. I haven't encountered it as often now. Is parents saying to their kid, if you go and join that group, I want nothing to do more to do with you. You're not my son or daughter any longer. Haven't heard that in a long time now. Where parents just uh, disown their kids. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, it used to be a big... You still get it with some fundamentalist Christian groups. You still get it in terms of things like disfellowshipping and um, disconnecting and shunning in certain groups. Uh, and, you know... And of course, you do an ex very extreme Islamic groups where they'll kill you for it. Um, yeah, they kind of the take whole, apostasy a little seriously in in the yeah, in yeah. Fun fundamentalist when, Islamic groups, any kind yeah. of any kind of fundamentalist mindset, whether it's yeah. Christian or Muslim or Jewish or even secular. Yeah. Um, you you do find a kind of a fundamentalism there where. Um, well, I call it militant atheism. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a good. That's a. That's a good. As as good a term as any. But I have fundamentalist a, atheism doesn't that that nobody's going to accept that term. <laughs> and and yet it's a valid term. You know this. No, idea I get it. I get it. This, I'm just saying. <laughs> or or in my language, extremist. Right. Um, right. This 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 kind of absolutism. I have actually met people who have said, "Well, my family have told me that if I join this religion." Um. 
th they disowned me and it was a secular family it was an atheist family um, which <laughs> right. surprised me the first time that happened i was shocked you know? yeah i'd be surprised um, by that too that's disappointing was, actually it was gosh it was in fact it was before i came to this country it was um a, it was a young girl who had left prostitution and her father said that he'd rather have her as a prostitute than as a member of this religion that she was joining which i thought was whoa <laughs> wow that was that was as that was as weird as i've ever heard in my life you know he would rather have her go back to prostitution i thought there's something really wrong with that family but i wasn't you know i wasn't in a position to get involved so i let it i had to let it go wow which i was sad about but uh now coming back to your question you have to have something to come out too otherwise you're not safe leaving the reason people are in very extreme groups is very often a matter of fear and finding safety in some sense you know there is some sense for example the unificationist that told me that the first time they left lancaster gate uh they got all they got as far as the end of the street and were afraid to cross the street because only a few weeks before one of the one of the teachers had been giving a, a talk and had explained how somebody had left them and had crossed the road and was run over by a bus and killed and that this was a divine action in some way to to judge them for leaving the unification church and so she sat on the curb until somebody came out and got her and pulled her back into the lancaster gate where she stayed another six months or something whatever it was you know that kind of extreme fear induction or maybe the lesser version of fear induction well these people just they're they're bad they're um they're karmically diseased or they are suppressive or whatever the lingo in the particular group is that says if you're around these people they will damage you right. and that kind of thing you've got to have something to offset that and so that means that sometimes you have to say to people um prepare to if they really want to leave prepare to leave but it, you know give me a couple of weeks if, if we've actually been working together this is at one end they've actually been working together with me and or with their family without me even stay in the group but prepare to get out and i'll let you know when we have a safe place for you to be where they can't find you i we have had to on very rare occasions but we have had to find a place where they can be where the group couldn't find them um, less extreme than that was, for example, one person who was brought to me under false pretenses. They were told that if they didn't talk to me, um, their, their group would be raided by the police and arrested because they, 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 they lived in a group home. And the group would be raided and, and arrested, and they would be charged with various drug offenses and things because the police would plant drugs on them. Do you know what we call that? Lying? I think we call that undue influence. Oh, yeah. I think we oh, call I, that coercive persuasion. Absolutely. I think that's a bad thing. It's a bad thing. Yeah, meanwhile, I think that's what I we call that. Told, meanwhile, <laughs> I was that. told. Yeah, I, exactly. Precisely. I was told that this person had written a letter to the person who was arranging this meeting. And I could see them, the, 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 they would show me the letter when I got down there to see them because they were only able to get away from their group for that one day. They had to travel to London from far away. And I would be shown the letter to, to reassure me that they had agreed and were volunteering to speak to me. We sat in the room for almost an hour. I, I had to, to, to ask the people who had come to, be, to, to, to arrange this thing. I'd ask them to go into another room, let just let the two of us talk at first. They sat and stared at me for most of an hour. And finally, I, I, I realized that I'd been lied to because they couldn't find the letter. That should have been my first warning, but I thought, okay, you, you lose things. It, you know, it was a couple of young guys. You don't expect a couple of young guys in their early 20s to be sensible necessarily. Maybe they lost the letters. Give them the benefit of the doubt. And finally, I said, you don't want to be here, do you? Dead stare. You don't want to talk to me, do you? Dead stare. Were you tricked into coming here? Were you threatened in any way? And then out came the story. So I said, okay, I'm getting you out of here. 
called them in, said, I had to leave my house so early, which I did. I had to leave my house before breakfast. I had to leave it so early. I didn't have breakfast. Would you mind getting me something to eat? They didn't have anything in the house to eat. They had to go shopping because they normally go, went down to some cafe to eat their breakfast. So I said, you know, no, I need food. Got them out of the house, took the person, escorted them to the train, got them on a train back to their home. And uh, in the, along the way, I had to explain to these two men that they were going to go to jail for kidnapping if they interfered with me. Gave this person my phone number and said, if you ever change your mind, as far as I'm concerned, you're going back to the group because that's where you're safe. Don't talk to these people anymore. If you ever want to talk to me, here's my phone number, call me. 18 months later, I got a phone call. And that was the beginning. But they needed to go back because that's where they were safe. And I have no problem with doing that, you know. Um, and I would have no problem. I have had no problem when somebody was thinking about leaving, but they had no, nowhere to go, saying to them, well, sit tight and let's arrange for you to be, to be safe when you come out. Interesting. Now, People I want to say, first of all, well, I'd like to stress two things there, because I'm pretty sure both of these things are true. And I want to ask you one, were you and, and we'll talk about this in more detail in a second, but just a simple yes, no, right now, were you paid to do that by no. those two men? No, they offered me money. I don't work for pay. Right. We'll I get do to all that. my work. I do all my yeah. work without a fee. So the answer Perfect. is no. And two. Were you sending this person back to a situation where they could have been or there was a threat or fear of them being physically or sexually assaulted? No. Right. No, I, we already talked about that. And uh, I was quite satisfied. And I knew the group really well. So I was quite satisfied that that was not where the danger lied. The danger was with these two people. Oh, no doubt. I, you've laid it out very clearly. I just want to quell any questions people might have about how dare you you know, turn the tables on the two people who called you for help in the first place. But then, it, but when you explain the situation, it's very clear why you did. But I also want to stress that you weren't taking money from these people either to oh, no. do that. So, because there's, you know, you know how people assume things and there's judgment out there. So yeah. just want to clarify those things. Now, I now want to ask you in more detail, what do you mean you don't take any money from anybody for doing this? How have you made a living doing this since 1973 without getting paid? Well, it's I don't look at it as a living, first of all. Okay. Um, this, this goes back to something that I should explain sooner or later, because otherwise people are going to get all tangled up, because people do get tangled up about it. Um, as I explained, there came a point in time when I became a Christian. Now... I know that means a lot of different pe things to a lot of different people. And right now, it means some pretty toxic things in our world. And I won't go any further than that, but you know, I think you know where I'm going with it. Um, there are toxic versions of Christianity, just like there are toxic versions of pretty much any ideology or belief system you can name. Um, and so what I have to say, first of all, is that it's on... It's on the basis of being a Christian that I think it's my, it's in my ability to help people be healthy and whole and safe. And that means to me that my Christianity, it doesn't, being a Christian doesn't mean that I put expectations on other people how to behave. It means I have expectations on how I behave. That's people about the come, healthiest attitude I can think of to as to how to describe how to be a good Christian. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think it's common sense, really. I think if, if anybody stopped and thought about it, it's not meant to be the imposition of my opinions or my beliefs on other people. It's meant to be my conformity to what I think, to what I think I am. Um, and that means, for example, that people come and they're homeless. They are poor. Sometimes they're even bankrupt. They have been fleeced every way imaginable. Imaginable. They're emotionally vulnerable. They're vulnerable every way you can think of. It is not my job to put more burden on them. You see what I mean? Yeah, oh yeah. So, so I mean, one of the things. 
I think if I were to talk about toxic Christianity, I would say that they're not Christian enough. That's their problem. They think they're being really Christian. They're not being Christian enough. Otherwise, they'd stop being toxic. Um, I have, to me, being a Christian means what did Jesus say about this? And what Jesus, you know, the, 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 the description of Jesus is that he would come into the world. He would not quench a burning flax. He would not break a bruised reed. Well, that means to me, in practical terms, in everyday practical terms, that I shouldn't be a further burden to people who are already carrying more than they can endure. So for me, to, for me to charge somebody means that I'm asking them to be even more burdened just to get help than they would be sitting there suffering as they are now. How is that going to help anybody? Now, I've got to add something here because I know there are a lot of my colleagues, people who are better trained than I am, who are doing, who are probably doing better work than I am, but they do charge because it is their profession. And it's, it's, it's right. If it's your profession, it's right to do your profession and get paid for it. I have no, I'm not arguing with them. I'm just saying that for me, I'm not doing this as my job. I'm doing this as what I think of as my calling. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense to anybody except me, but to me, it makes good sense that um, people, if I'm doing something extraordinary, like when I, there have been times when I've had to travel hundreds of miles to go and see somebody, I will let people pay my expenses. I won't ask for, the, for it in, or insist on it, but I will, I will accept it if they do. But that's a, to me, that's a different thing from a fee mm -hmm. because because it's different. Um, that's just getting me into the place where I can do my work for free. That's, that's how I look at that. But a fee has the, has the disadvantage of burdening somebody further. And I just, you know, I just can't do that. I know what it's, I know what it's like to be that poor. I know what it's like to be that hopeless and that helpless and i wouldn't wish that on anybody i certainly wouldn't do it to anybody so that's how i look at that the other thing practically speaking is that because i don't take a fee when parents say to me i want you to get my kid out of xyz group they're not paying me <laughs> i will do what i think is best and if i think what is best is to protect that person from being dragged out of the group kicking and screaming i'll protect them i'm free to do that i'm not being i'm not being paid to accomplish their agenda i am working for free to accomplish what i think is the right agenda which means always the safety of the member interesting is that, you see what i mean totally she's, she's, makes sense the family is not in danger if let's you know let's suppose you had a relative in scientology mm -hmm you're not endangered by them being in Scientology. They're in danger. And they're in danger according to certain things you might do to make their life worse. So all the burden is on them, not you. So my job has to be to protect the person who's in danger, not the person who's sitting outside living a normal life. Now that doesn't mean that I don't take the damage these groups do seriously because i do they are as you say destructive that is the perfect word for them it simply means that it simply means that if a person is is in trouble and you're going to hurt them worse by whatever you do for them you should be re really doing something else dragging them out of a group that they're not ready to leave may not be the right thing for them they need safety first uh, it's it's maybe that's a bit of a convoluted explanation, but I don't think so. I think it's pretty clear, and anybody who's listening to the words that you're saying is going to get it. So I, you know, it's it's understandable. You're not acting like a cult apologist right now. You are not saying that some people are better off in Scientology than not. It's not what you're saying. You're talking about very context specific situations. Yeah, and always. And that is the only way to deal with these situations. So I'm going to be the last person. In all the years I've been looking at this, I get exactly what you're saying, and I don't have a problem with it. Because okay. some, if you have a, a potentially uh, abusive uh, family situation, 
then why would you take somebody who's in good health and good standing in a what we acknowledge is a destructive group? Yeah. And put them in a more destructive situation by your assessment right then and there of what's going on, right? And like you mentioned, the two guys who were more than happy to kidnap or or yeah. uh, extort or bribe or whatever they were doing, you know, to to get this person to even sit in a room and talk to you. You go, wait a mm-hmm. second, this is, and then they're lying to you about it. Yeah. Well, trust is broken up one way and down the other in that situation. So, you know, how can you possibly uh, support that and send that person in good conscience back to those people? So it totally makes sense. And I think anybody who's looking at the big picture here gets that. Now, the other side of that, too, I should say, is that very often I found it's possible to work with a family where, let's say it's the parents we're talking about, where the parents have been... um, I think that the, the modern term is helicopter parenting, but let's call it over parenting just to cover all the bases. It is possible to take the time to work with the parents and get them to the place where they see that they need to make a new start. And, you know, just begin again with the, with the, the with what they think of as their child, uh, which I understand, you know, when, once you're a parent, you are a parent forever. Uh, I sometimes tell the story of my father, who at the age of 40-odd, we went over to visit my grandmother, his mom. We went over to visit her, and it was an autumn day, a bit nippy in the air. First thing she said to him when we walked in the door is, Leo, where's your coat? It's cold out. (laughs) You just never get away from that. You know, you're a parent forever. Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily say it. But I would think it. <laughs> of course, of course. You know, and and, and but there there comes a point where you've got to enable the parent to see. There's a difference between how you relate to a child, child, and the way you relate to an adult child, and you've got to observe that difference. And it's hard. There's no getting around it. It's hard, and some of us struggle with it more than others. Some of us are okay with it, but by working with the parents, it becomes possible to say now. You've, you know, you've, you've reassessed how you think of your, your child, go talk to them again and say, look, you know, we think we may have messed up here, but we would like to talk to you about the future, Uh, the future, the open end. That's where, that's where the hope is. And then it becomes possible. Maybe very often it has proven possible to get their son or daughter to sit down with them and say, well, look, this is what's been going on with me. Every time I tell you or start to tell you why I joined this group, you shout me down, you tell me I'm stupid, you you know, listen to him. He's telling you something important. And he's telling you why you need to say, I'm sorry, let's start again. Exactly. He's telling you that the only hope for the future relationship is that you're not going to do that anymore. (laughs) <laughs> and then, and then, you know, and that way there's an open door to go forward, to fix things. That's right. You know and I mean? you would think that, you know, I, I'm just going to say, uh, you know, we're harping an awful lot here on listening, on tolerance, on compassion. Um, and I get so many comments from people, probably younger people who really haven't thought the thought through too much. But I'm, I get so many comments on my videos about what idiots cult members are, what stupid morons you'd have to be. And I'll harp on this a lot because even to this day, today, I still get comments on my videos about this constantly, right? People fly by, you know, and ah, a bunch of morons, you know. This kind of past drive-by judgment happens every day, all day, right? Because I'm seeing it. So it has to be. I mean, there's no question that there are parents, that there are family members, that there are friends who do that to people who are in these groups and it is You're right you know and all i'm gonna say for, is the same thing I, I said from day one it's wrong don't talk to people in these groups like that you are you are you are literally pushing them harder into these groups when you do that that's the real issue there you know? when when we when we treat someone with disrespect because we disagree with them we're pushing them deeper into the thing we disagree with uh, that means that that means that nobody learns anything Nobody grows, nobody goes forward, you know, and, and you're actually helping them to stay stuck. Exactly. Uh, and, and also, you're, you're disrespecting them from the standpoint that part of recovery, I, I have seen so many people recover 
from their involvement. And every time I'm so impressed by how bright they are, how intelligent they are, how they almost instinctively know what they need to do to recover. If only they can be shown how to make it work for them. They, th th I, I, I often tell my clients that they know better than I do what they need next. And my job, as I see it, is to encourage them to put their finger on that thing that's kind of pulsing away inside that says, I need to do this. I need to learn that. I need to find out about this. I need to think about that. I need to try doing this. And they far outstrip expectations that you could ever have for them. You know, you, you see somebody who goes from having a very basic education to going into higher education and succeeding. You see somebody who has been thwarted all their lives and suddenly becoming really good at their music or really good at their art or really good at something else or just finding satisfaction in their life and becoming really good at the, their chosen profession and just loving being alive. And you think, you know, you, you, can't, you can't label that person as deficient or stupid or socially backward or any of these other things that people say about ex-members and members. It's nonsense. It's just, it, it reflects a, a lack of understanding of people. Because these they tend to be bright people. And most of all, they tend to be people who want to make a difference in the world and make the world a better place. And they were sold a bill of goods by some con man who dressed himself up as a guru or um, a psychologist or a teacher or whatever, you know, the, the, the next big thing with all the answers. But these are people who want to make the world a better place. These are people, give them half chance and the world will be better for them having been in it that's a great and that's a great viewpoint it's a great viewpoint um it's how it is <laughs> thank you <laughs> that's right um i want to ask you i want to move towards wrapping this up but there is another topic i want to ask you about first and that is you're not hiding you're there in the uk you've been doing this work since 1973 have any of these groups ever really seriously come after you? And if so, what, what happened? Hmm. Uh, funnily enough, funnily enough, it wasn't what you'd expect. You'd expect it to have been Scientology. For some reason, Scientology has seen fit to not come after me in any significant way. Um, I am careful. I have noticed when people have been following me, and I usually... Um, park in front of the nearest police station and take down their number plates. Um, we had a bomb threat once. Um, I've had anonymous threats of various kinds, but as far as I know, it's not usually been Scientology. There have been other groups and I've had, I've had the odd lawsuit threatened, um, which in, in, in you know, it was it was a case of saying, you know, let's meet over a cup of coffee and talk about the lawsuit and then saying, this is what I'll be, be presenting in court should you choose to take me to court. And that would that's always been the last I've ever heard from anybody, um, because what I had what I had to show the court and which would have become public record was far worse than what they were accusing me of saying. Right. Um, and they decided it wasn't worth it. But I've been. I've been remarkably unhassled. And I think part of the reason is because I don't regard any of these people as deadly enemies. And I'm not looking to hurt anybody. Um, you know, I'm just trying to make sure nobody's getting hurt. Right. And if you're doing the hurting, well, you know, at some point we're going to fall out. But what happens next is up to you. You're not my enemy. I don't have any, I don't have enemies. I have people who don't like me. Uh, I've been, I have been called, I've been labeled a deadly demon. I've been called, <laughs> various, I've been called various other things at various times, but um, yeah, you know, I think, I think a combination of a little bit of care and the fact that I'm not, a, I'm not a campaigner as such. I think had I become a, a major campaigner, I would have attracted more flack. 
I think you're right. But, but you know, my, right. my job right. is taking care of people who are hurting. Yeah. And I'm not worth the effort. I think genuinely the, the, the real issue here is I'm not worth the effort for most people. Right. Um, there are bigger well, fish to fry. Well, that's why I wanted to get the word out about what you're doing. Because oh, so they can come I, after me. <laughs> oh, God, no. No, no, no. Please don't misunderstand no. me. What I wanted no. to get the word out about about what you're doing so that other people could do it too. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'd love that. I would love to see that happen. That's what I'm trying to do here. Yeah, I, and I want I people to... to see that yeah, I really want people to see that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. But that tunnel can take a little time to navigate. It can, yeah. it, it takes patience. It really does. It is, you know, the getting somebody out of one of these groups or talking to them about these groups or however you want to approach it is a long-term strategy, I think, almost universally. Would you agree with that? Yeah. And I, and I think the fact that you see that means that you can take it slowly enough so that the person comes along with you rather than being dragged and and then you you end up with them resisting because they know you're pulling on them they they know you've got an agenda right. um if if you have an agenda that people know it if you're trying to do something to them they know it um and letting them go at their own pace to me that's a matter of trusting the person's instinct to survive and to to find a better way than they've had and i trust i you know i trust my clients instincts they know what they need even though they don't know it necessarily and by giving them that time it's not it, it's not hurting me to give them that time where it becomes a problem is because for various reasons whether it's health insurance in the u.s or the uh the nhs in the uk counseling tends to be time limited you know they, they talk in terms of a half a dozen sessions or a dozen a dozen sessions or whatever and that just won't do it it sometimes I've had people sit and stare at me for 45 minutes before they'll talk to me um, because it, it takes them that long to decide, yeah, I can trust him. And then they'll talk. You can't box people down into a 50 minute hour over six sessions or a dozen sessions. You have to be able to give them time. And my, my, I try in my approach to go one step further and I try to put the clients in charge. So if somebody has a natural rhythm of, say, a two-hour session, they've got two hours of my time. I schedule it that way. My early sessions with somebody are open-ended. They'll tell me when they're finished. I make a point of saying, look, you're, you're, it's up to you how long you need for us to talk, especially in these early sessions, and I'll follow your lead. So if somebody needs to unburden themselves and we spend four hours, I've sat seven hours on a telephone back in the old days when everything was you know, either telephone or in person. That's, that's what they needed. It's not for me to say, well, sorry, we're done here. My clock says we're done. That's not how it works for me. So yes, it is time intensive, but that's how long it takes to heal. That's how long it takes to heal. Sometimes what I do is it would be considered beyond the pale of normal, of, of normal work with people. But to me, the need determines the process, not the other way around. Well, I hope that folks out there who are listening are listening closely to all of this because this is how it gets done. You know, if you want to get folks, I mean, no, but seriously, people have this idea that you're going to have this one off conversation with somebody or you're going to scream and yell at them or you're going to talk sense to them or it's going to be a one and done or something like that. And they have very unrealistic expectations of how people get into these groups and what it takes to get them out of them. And and if, if I may, I would just add one thing to that. And yeah. it's not only it's not only counterproductive, it, uh, non-productive, but it's actually counterproductive because if you invest everything in a one and done conversation, you're in a sense giving that person an ultimatum. But you're also giving yourself an ultimatum. You're saying if this conversation doesn't work, we've got nothing more to say to each other. That is a dreadful position to put yourself or the other person in. It means you have cut yourself off from helping them and they feel cut off from receiving help. You don't want to do that. Exactly. You know, exactly. I, this isn't like somebody drowning <laughs> where, right. you, where you grab them now or they die. This is more like they're wandering down a path in the woods and they're not sure where they're going anymore. They're lost. 
and you're trying to show them that these signposts that they're passing from time to time are actually pointing in the direction that they want to go if they you know if they if they're willing to try it there we go and okay. again we will stress that the, and i know we've covered this before i'm just going to stress it again if there is an imminent threat of physical danger, sexual assault, you know, uh, or even, you know, like a, a real threat, you have evidence of financial ruination on the on the doorstep of this person, then faster action is required. Law enforcement's required. Like more drastic actions are required here. We're, we're talking about the slow and steady wins the race approach here. And it is something that is going to work a lot more often than people think it will. I think the problem with a lot of people is they is they're impatient, they're they're freaked out, they're upset, they are themselves stressed, and they want to get their loved one out of this situation, and they don't understand that they need to calm the hell down, and the way to do it is slow and steady wins the race, and that will get you the success you want, if you're willing to put the time and effort into doing it right, you know. Yeah. So that's why I thought it would be great to talk to you about this, and and it has been. Thank you so much for your time on this, and 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 folks out there, I'm I'm sure this is not going to be the last time me and Christian talk. I just wanted to get it in, yeah, I just wanted to kind of kind of give a big overview here of of who you are, what you're about, what you do, and okay. and highlight to people that that this approach works, and it, and it works a lot. I'm curious, have you kept numbers? I haven't no um because because in the early days there was this question of groups including especially Scientology and particularly Scientology actually um arranging raids on people to seize files and things like that um and because of the the general problem of burglary mm -hmm. which happily happily has not happened but it could have always happened I make a point of purging files when I'm when I'm finished with a client I let go of people my my whole thing here is that I do what people need and then I let go of them I know there are some people who maintain a more prolonged contact but as far as I'm concerned you know if if you need to talk to me that's different but once once you've decided we're done your files are gone because the shredder is the safest place for them. That means there, I, have no, I have no information on you that could hurt you if somebody burgled my office. It means that you don't have to worry about what you may have said to me that I've got in a file someplace. You know, you're gone. You are now just another person living your life for the future. Uh, I still get Christmas cards and, and greetings from people from time to time, which I appreciate very much. It's nice to hear from people that, you know, this is what's happening. Here's a picture of my kids or whatever it is. And I, I enjoy that, but I don't keep their files. That's what I have. A, a, I've got a shredder that turns everything into one millimeter by one millimeter pieces of paper, confetti, and that's it. You know, they're gone. because. Fair because letting go of people like that means that they're safe that that to me that's part of their safety because they're scientology is the most well-known group to attack ex-members but they're not the only one so um I, li I like to make sure that i am doing more than could be required you know now we have in this country things like gdpr and and all the data protection act type of things i've been doing that long before it was required because i could see the need for it and uh and i'm glad i have done because i know when i when i hear from people it's not because they're worried that i've got some some information on them uh, or because they feel some obligation to me it's because they want to, to say you know just saying hello letting you know how we're getting on i'm a grandfather now or whatever and that's cool nice well let me ask you this if you were going to guesstimate how many people do you think you've worked with since uh, over all these years almost 50 now I would have to go well some years it depends on i should i have to preface that by saying different kinds of work take different time i you know i have several levels mm -hmm. where sometimes sometimes i will have just a series of conversations with somebody and that really is all they've needed not everybody is equally harmed by their experience um some people half a dozen conversations or a dozen conversations or maybe a couple of dozen conversations space that over a period of time and that's all they need maybe you know 
other people, it's very intensive work for a year or even two years. Um, sometimes I've got one person that pops up about every three months and we do an intensive couple of days and then they vanish again for another couple of months. It works for them. But what that means is that it's, it's hard to kind of predict how those numbers work out, but it probably works out to be two or 300 people a year. Wow. Wow. Something that's like, a lot of people. That's a lot of people. You're yeah, it is. With. But, but as I say, some, you know, there, there's a, a, a hefty proportion of those people who are only people that needed, you know, a set of conversations and milder work. Other people require the more intense thing of, you know, giving, giving them a lot of information, asking them to try a lot of different things in their life, giving them exercises to do, um, to, to practice new ways of relating to people or whatever it might be. Um, more, more heavy supervision is required for that kind of thing. More, more involvement, let's call it, is required for that. Um, I really couldn't say, but you know, it's probably somewhere, be, you know, some years are what you might call slack years and maybe 150 or 200 people. No, Other people oh, you, you were slacking off those years. <laughs> I know. Just taking yeah. a break that year. Just 150 yeah. people well, this year. Yeah, I, you know. I used to have I used to have a really good trustee who had who who kept numbers on calls in and and you know the the phone traffic basically, and when she was doing that, there were some years that were really quite astonishing where we'd have inquiries from you know there were there were some years where we have 450 500 inquiries now not all of those inquiries required intensive work. But that's still, that's a lot of traffic. You know, each phone yeah. call could be an hour or two at a time. Yeah, that's a lot but of work you've been working I've never really on. been interested in the numbers. I understand that, you know, some people consider that irresponsible. You, you, you need to keep track of the numbers so people know what's going on. It was never, uh, I'm a car mechanic. I'm not a researcher. I'm not a, you know, right. I don't design cars. I just fix them. Right. Well, like I said, I think if, I think if you were, uh, I mean, I think if you were a licensed therapist or something, we'd be, it might be having a different conversation about the records you keep, but oh, yeah. you know, you're yeah. not any of those things. And yeah. so, uh, so it's great. You know, I was just kind of curious ballparking the, the numbers on this. So Christian, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate you taking a couple hours to sit and chat with me about all this and, and go over pleasure. this stuff. It's a pleasure talking to you. You know, when I first heard you were going to be, at the at the conference back in in 2015 in Canada. Yeah, back in Toronto. My, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking to myself, you know, th this guy's not that long out. He's uh, you know he's he's been staff. He's you know he's been one of the big guys. It'd be interesting to 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 find out what that's like. And I met you, and you're just the nicest guy. I couldn't. It was. <laughs> I hate to say this, but I almost. I hope you'll take this the right way. I almost couldn't take you seriously as a Scientologist. But I thought, <laughs> nobody right. this nice goes on Scientology staff and bullies people. It just doesn't happen. And I just, you know, I just look at you and I think to myself, oh, no, come on. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but I understand also the transition you had to make to become the person you are. That's right. So, uh, yeah. so I've been looking yeah. forward. Well, awesome, man. Thank you very much for this. I I wish I could say I was I was never a tyrant, but I, I definitely had my tyrannical moments. But we uh, all have our moments from back in those days. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Now, how would people reach out to you if they wanted to contact you following the show and they have a need to talk to you? Okay, we have a website which needs to be populated with more information uh desperately and when i get some spare time when when i when i can slack off the next time i can slack <laughs> off i'm going to populate that website um but the website is dialoguecenter.org.uk it's spelled d i a l o g c e n t r e and that's all as one word .org.uk if you get it wrong you might end up at the wrong website so um, well, I'll put a link to that to in link. the description section here on say. YouTube, folks, and it's simplyspeaking.com. And there is a contact page there, and people can contact me that way. Excellent. All right, folks. I hope that this has been interesting and entertaining and informative to you. It certainly was to me. And uh, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, good, bad, or sideways, leave them in the comments section here on YouTube or at sensiblyspeaking.com. 
And as I am wont to do, I will remind you that ad hominem comments are not appreciated and will probably be moderated out of existence. But if you have something constructive to say in a critical fashion, we're okay with that. I am more than happy to look at anything, contemplate any idea you might want to throw my way. And um, I will I will ask Christian when this goes up, I will let him know and maybe he might pop up and take a look at some of the comments too. Of course. Awesome, man. All right. Thanks again for doing this. Uh, folks, I will see you guys again next week. And if you find this content useful, helpful, informative, and even mildly entertaining, then perhaps consider joining me on Patreon to help support this channel and this podcast and keep it going because it's uh, this is 100,000% fan funded. All right, guys. See you next week. Bye-bye.